some stupid fuck. You fire without looking? You fire without a warning, without a fucking brain in your head? Oh, shit. If I buy one, you motherfucker, I'm not gonna buy it from you. Hey, everybody. In a couple minutes, there's gonna be the regular episode where me, Duncan, and Smoke talk about Bubble Boy, but if you've ever listened to any episodes that we've been on, while we did manage to talk about the movie at points, it was one of those more rambling conversations. Surprise, surprise. But it was recorded the day before George Floyd was killed in Minneapolis. So we did not obviously address that. Uh, A lot of stuff has happened since then also there there have been other killings just before that and since but george floyd was you know presently the face of this larger tragedy and uh, there you know there have been protests in all 50 states and in other countries solidarity protests talked to some of our friends here over there and uh you know it's been really fucked up emotional time between the recording of this and now but i just was sitting there with it and as the show does you know we we talk about a lot of socio-political things Uh, before we go into something that was unaware of this movement that's going on right now taking place and taking shape i i think we talked a little bit about police brutality in the episode as you would imagine comes up it's one of the things that the three of us always seem to agree upon some people are going to protests some are not Uh, there's lots of ways you can protest i was talking with some friends and i things that people can do if we're in the middle of a fucking pandemic too it's doable to socially distance with your mask when you're not getting tea kettled by riot cops on horses and getting tear gas, pepper sprayed, or rubber bulleted and stuff like that. And that's a whole other level to what's going on. I've talked to some people and I've, you know, there's been dialogues that's gone on inside my house. Uh, things that you can do, you can go to a protest. Please be safe. Always better to go with a friend if you can. You should look into supplies and whatnot that you should uh, take to a protest or who to look for if you need something, if you need some sort of help. There are some groups that are doing online protest medic training. Despite what uh, Bill Barr and Bunker Boy would say, anti-police brutality, anti-fascism, Antifa is not an organization. So there's not a website that addresses every community's need. But usually there is a decent amount that you can find. I'm always happy to help. You know, if you're a listener, if you're in a group or you're on the Twitter account for the show, I'm around, but uh, sorry, I'm. it's like we all know, it's a weird, wild fucking time, but you can donate to a bail fund. The protesters are getting arrested pretty regularly. I think over the weekend, there were almost 100 people arrested just in Columbus. You can donate medical supplies. You can buy food for protesters, give food to protesters. You can, uh, you know, the, the guy in D.C. that sheltered, what, 70 to 100 people in his house while they were waiting out the police down there. You can continue to educate the people around you. You can pick up people from when there are a lot of protests. They get streets closed off and people can't get their cars. People need rides. You get separated from groups. You know, you can be on the lookout for people that need rides. That's, again, please be careful, especially if it's not somebody in your bubble. Safety reasons and pandemic reasons. Donate straight to a frontline people and organizations you can write articles you can get a hold of paper you can get a hold of your city council your local government lots of shit in that way and there's always a lot of talk about police reform (laughs) nervous laughter not intended i feel like with all the protests and my local police are very fond of the chemical agents but I feel like with it happening in so many places, this is a lot of people's first awareness of these sort of tactics and a response to things. And so just thematically for the moment, maybe something you want to check out 
there is a nonprofit called Campaign Zero. They're a police reform, anti police brutality group. They have a website for a study that was done over eight policies based on some research that was done that if all eight are in place, they reduce police killings by 72% compared to cities that don't use them. On the website, sort of lays out the different eight, and it's uh, if you're in one of the 100 biggest cities in America, they're, they're on there. You can look at it. Of the 100, only San Francisco, California, and Tucson, Arizona have all eight policies, but you can get a hold of your mayor, your sheriff through the website. I looked up my city. I looked up Columbus. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But it's uh, Campaign Zero and Eight Can't Wait, uh, the, le- the number eight. Uh, you should maybe check out. They're banning chokeholds and strangleholds, require de-escalation, where officers have to communicate with subjects, maintain distance, and otherwise diffuse tense situations whenever possible, require a warning before shooting, yeah, that's not always a requirement. Exhaust all other means before shooting. Uh, would you be surprised to know that if this is just a rule in a police department, it can reduce violence by 25%? Duty to intervene where officers have to stop other officers from using excessive force and report incidents when they do occur. Banning shooting at moving vehicles. Require a use of force continuum. Uh, this, this limits weapons or force that can be used depending on a situation or uh, require comprehensive reporting every time officers use force or threaten force against someone, they, they have to report it. Those seem pretty reasonable to me. Uh, I don't know about you. Kind of redo the, the way policing is done in the States, but yeah. Anyway, it doesn't sound fucking crazy. So yeah. Those eight, like I said, I looked up Columbus, Ohio, bans chokeholds and cartoid restraints, and less in deadly force situation. However, during a situation involving the influence or threatened infliction of serious physical harm, the use of an untrained response like neck restraints, while not normally authorized, may be reasonable to end the threat to survive the encounter. So... That right now, that with the way things are, that counts as banning joke holds and strangle holds. So that's how light the current rules are in place. Columbus is listed as having requiring de-escalation, requires warning shots, does not require exhaust all alter- alternatives before shooting, does not require duty to intervene, does not ban shooting at moving vehicles, It does have a use of force continuum, but as you saw in the chokehold ban, it's pretty lax. And there there is no required comprehensive reporting. So, I don't know. It's it's just something something to look into. Uh, Another thing that seems to be popular among people and a popular idea, but not popular amongst police officers who presently kind of get to investigate themselves uh this look citizen review boards uh, there, there's talk of that you know over the uh past weekend a city council president i think the president pro tem and congresswoman from the third district uh in u.s congress were all in a afternoon march that got sprayed by the police it seems like in places where elected officials who have power and notice this they seem i don't know i hope i'm not wrong about this but it feels different it feels like a boiling point i think i don't know i mean if you're listening to this show if this is not your first episode you know how i feel about things but if if you're new to the show and you think there's no problem with that if you think that police brutality is a myth you're not you're not gonna have any fun with this show ever but anyway Here's me and me and Smoke and Duncan talking about Bubble Boy and things that happened before the Fed uprising. We now return to our regular program schedule. I heard a can. Is it uh? It's four o'clock somewhere. Yeah, it's four o'clock here. Um, yeah. I, well, I thought I need. I I had forgotten exactly how bad bubble boy was uh, so. 
Uh-huh. Dear, time, time has not been kind to 2001. What's in that can, you Kraken? Uh, I am drinking Brewdog's brand new prototype tropical Nipa, Nipa, or I don't have a fucking clue. Um, it's a very fruity beer. I didn't expect it to be as fruity as it is, but uh, yeah, it's not too bad. Five percent, so that'll do. I arrived today, I ordered that a week ago, um, and one of our yeah, where it's free delivery this weekend, so stock up. And you're like, yeah, I'll just buy that. I'll buy that shit. I'll buy some beer. And then you buy it, you get through the checkout, and at the end it's like that. Remember COVID situation? It's going to be delayed. I'm like, well, you should have put that at the start. Um, <laughs> I just bought it in a shop. but um, So there we go. I don't know. How are we all doing? <laughs> How's life? <laughs> oh, you know, living in the bubble. Yep. We picked this before COVID, by the way. I just want to stress that. <laughs> we did. This has been a long time coming. I think this was talked about even back before we did Starship Troopers, which I think was like three years ago. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Is it the longest that? <laughs> it's been a while. Oh. I mean, we did that. I think we did that the first year. <laughs> She did not drop stain there, smoke. <laughs> Aaron Lewis has went goddamn fucking nuts, by the way. See, the last two years of Aaron Lewis is like, it's just a, it's it's like a window into the, the soul of a guy who just doesn't get life. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Is that like, I'm, I'm not for assassinations at all, but... I'm just saying no one's no one's weeping if that guy gets shot. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no innocent bystander if he's in the cross. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I just want to stress that this is for humoristic purposes and not because I actually want to see Anne Lewis shot. Because, as Smoke said, he's on the outside and he's looking in. <laughs> see, through you, see through the real you. Um... But inside, inside you're ugly. Oh, That's all you're showing. Oh, then have me. I'm like, yep, yeah, that's right. Thank you, Fred Durst. I'm feeling those riders. Yeah. It's the real <laughs> motherfucking deal, y'all. Right. In the, middle, in the middle of a ballad, if ever you wanted your ballad, your heartfelt ballad about struggles to do with uh, your identity, your personality, your appearance, you need some Fred Durst saying, this is the real motherfucking deal, y'all. <laughs> oh, he, just, he just pops in like he's Flavor Flav. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> boy! Like, <laughs> like, Fred Durst's the reason he got a record contract. He signed them. He signed them the same year he signed Puddle of Mud. And if you've seen that video of Wes Scatland singing Nirvana, it's the greatest gift the internet's given me this year. Just, have you seen it yet, Smog? Yeah, it's it's very terrible. <laughs> it's, it's, but it, but it's like he's almost he's almost got the voice down, but then he yeah. goes way off. <laughs> Like there's like the occasional, you know, that way like where you you know you can do an impression of someone, but the impression is maybe a sentence, and you dare not veer off from that sentence because yeah. that's when it goes to shit. That's him. He's like he's got obviously like a line or two in that song where it's like I can sound like Cobain here as long as I don't have to sing the rest of it. Um, but <laughs> he's yeah. forced to sing the rest of it. He looks in pain, man. He looks uh, uh, genuinely in pain through most of it. And he's now complaining afterwards, like, because like, the video's doing the rounds. You know, I, I was really fucked up when I did that. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you still agreed <laughs> to do it, though. And you still let someone film you. <laughs> you hired I backup think... musicians. <laughs> I think that's his band. With him. Oh, that's that his band? Up. Yeah, that's his band. His band were there, and you can see it on their face that they were just like, uh, well, maybe maybe the rest of the world will see what we've been putting up with now. Um yeah, it's, uh, it was the best hit job that could ever be done against an artist. And then once again, another Fred Durst. So there's the two Fred Durst acquisitions. Both front men have went into the dark place. <laughs> 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 but Fred's fine. He made that movie, The Fanatic, which is like, I'm still not sure if I actually think it's a fucking genius movie or not. I, I, I genuinely think that movie is really, really something else. And I'm not even being sarcastic. 
Is that a Travolta film? Yeah, like Travolta, like it's playing that one hundred percent straight, and I think that's why it works because uh, he's like he he the, he's like as they say um, in Tropic Thunder. Uh, I just want to stress this is a line from that movie. You never go full retard, and he does. He really, really <laughs> does, and um, it's kind of amazing because he and, and the fact that he was doing the rims. You know, saying I should be getting. Why am I not up for an Oscar for this performance? Makes me think that you know he he really put time into that. <laughs> he crafted that character <laughs> in a way which I kind of adore. Um, and it's oh yeah, I, I, people will argue. People will be switching off your show right now because I'm defending Fred Durst. But um, yeah, the fanatic is actually a good movie. Um, <laughs> I really liked it. I really liked it. Um, and I just, I'm not sure if I like it because I think it's an absolute train wreck or I actually think it's maybe closeted genius. Travolta was in a uh, film where he had to live in a plastic bubble. Is that Battlefield like Earth? <clears throat> well, yeah, metaphorically. But... <laughs> but uh, but like the other film, that's what kept coming up when I was looking for the film that were. Ah, bubble boy. Yeah, there is a there's a what's it? The man in a plastic bubble or something from nineteen seventy something six two. Yeah, I think boy in the plastic bubble. Yeah, yeah. Which I would like to think this is not a remake of. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I don't know. It has to be inspired by at least by the real life version of I that. Don't... I don't know. I'm like part of me thinks there's. It's weird because like had had this movie come out in the nineties, I could understand it like like being like the next step in evolution from something like Biodome. Um, you know what I mean? That <laughs> horrendous. It's Polly Shore, isn't it? That's in that movie. Is yeah. it Polly Shore? Is it? And yeah. The, and Stephen uh, Baldwin. Yeah. Oh God! Who kind of looks like Jake Gyllenhaal has been made up to look like Stephen Baldwin in this movie? Yeah, that that hair, the hair and the face, and he's kind of like I love Gyllenhaal. I think Gyllenhaal is an incredible actor. I think you only need to watch like Donnie Darko's before this, but you oh you only need to see him in movies like um, a you know, enemy or prisoner like the stuff that he's done specifically with uh, Dennis Villeneuve but if you look at what was that one the night the night guy uh, where he's oh, like the, yeah nightcrawler incredible performance you know just he's like even even down to velvet buzzsaw which was not a movie I was particularly high on overall but his performance is great in it and then you remember that at one point he did bubble boy and someone that was clearly whispering in his ear saying, you need to take all the most obnoxious elements of an Adam Sandler performance and things like Happy Gilmore <laughs> and Billy Madison and combine them into one character and put a plastic bubble around them. It is, it is whoa. <laughs> um, yeah, that, like, I, I rented this off of uh, Google Play or whatever the fuck it's called. But, like, after the movie's over, that all the recommends at the bottom are Waterboy... Or uh, Billy Madison. <laughs> it's, it's like it's like the 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 Arnold Schwarzenegger steroid jacked up version of one of those movie performances in here. And it's I mean this is about the same time as things like Dude Where's My Car and you know this is all the the stuff you're getting post American Pie essentially. Uh, so Freddie Got Fingered is about this time as well. <laughs> um, so you like all the most of and I think the thing is at the time these movies were coming out. I'm in my late teens, so these are the funniest fucking movies ever made for me because they fit my horrible, snotty sense of humour and flagrant disregard for everything. Um, I, but now as like as a, as an older, more mature, but not really, uh, I don't looking back. I'm just like this. It, it almost doesn't qualify as being a movie. I did laugh. There, there were plenty of <laughs> scenes in this movie where I did. Like mostly at the mum. The mum is absolutely hilarious. See the the ransom note bit. Oh, yeah. she's, <laughs> she's, no way the Jews so, would only ask for that much money. The Jews would ask for more. It's like it's like absolutely. You know, like all that stuff is really really funny, and you know the. the I, I mean, this movie is so on PC. It's incredible. Um, the, the final scene with her and Trejo 
and then the dad. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I kind of laughed my ass off at that part. It's got a ridiculous cast as well. I mean, when you think about it, not even down to the fact that you have, you know, specifically like a young Gyllenhaal, but the fact that, you know, like, uh, you've got like Vern Troyer who would do all those um, Austin Power movies and whatnot, but you've even got people like Zach Galifianakis showing up in these tiny little performances and all these guys go off and do, you know, have become much bigger stars and all the rest, and they're all basically just playing small bit parts. And it's a bit part movie, very much like a dude wears my car. It's a, a kind of weird fantasy, over the top kind of set piece to set piece to set piece of who can we throw in here? What can they do? I mean, <laughs> to see. John Lynch is the husband in this and know that he is and will always be in my mind the Zodiac Killer. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. Also <laughs> with Jake all... Gyllenhaal, right? He was in also that movie. Also with Jake Gyllenhaal. You know, like, so you imagine the two of them reuniting after Bubble Boy <laughs> and a David Fincher movie about the most notorious uncaught serial killer in US history. It just it fucking blows my mind. Like, the, the, I just, I don't know. I don't know. We came up with this idea when we were smoking crack with Beetlejuice on the train set. Beetlejuice in this movie. Look at Beetlejuice. I forgot that guy existed. Totally dates it. Totally dates it. And then there's uh, that that Matthew McCrory guy who did like the he was like in WWE. Yeah, yeah. He he was he's in he's been in all those. So it's just a weird all that stuff. Yeah, totally. So strange, and we're just going to throw them all in a movie together. And, and I mean, what is the purpose of this movie? Can anyone tell me? Well, uh, it's just a goofy road trip it's, comedy. It's the 2001 a version of Odysseus, right? That did they, nobody else got that? Totally, the Greek tragedy. Yeah, yes, of course. yes. Try, trying to get home <laughs> to uh, what's her name? Penelope, Persephone, something. I can't remember the name of the the woman but i did you see that out. it's claimed that this was inspired by the uh boy in the plastic bubble you break out greek tragedies <laughs> yeah, he's, he's on a roll let him have it um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say this there will be a shock for darren's listeners right now because we have discussed much more about bubble boy than we have in any other movie conversation that we've ever done on this show. <laughs> now that's out of the minutes. way. <laughs> a solid 10 minutes. Um, Long Pigs was pretty... Well, pretty yeah. Hard. I think that was the first movie, though, that we did, and I think that's why I thought. I think we thought we had to be movie people. Yeah. And then after that, it was just like, how fucked is America? <laughs> yeah, pretty fucked. Yeah, that, so. was, that was episode seven. This is... Can you believe that you've got your, you've almost got your, uh, <laughs> like at uh, the risk of upsetting uh, the the apple cart here by overturning it? Can you believe you're that you're in election year right now? You made it, guys. You made it through safe. I mean, your economy's fucked. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, record unemployment, but but he didn't blow up the world. So those that said that he wouldn't press the big red button can sit and bask in their smugness. Except for they announced this week that they're considering restarting nuclear uh, bomb testing. He's just saying that. No one's restarting anything. Oh, is this the, uh, is this the, we need to show off for China and Russia? Of course. Thing? I don't know. It's, uh, what? I don't Yeah, I, I have no idea. Scattershot. Throw it all at the wall. See what sticks. <laughs> Got fucking Joe Biden over there. Say a dumb shit every time he shows up out of his God, hibernation. Joe Joe Biden is <laughs> Joe Biden is hilarious. It's like you got two comedians going at each other. You, like a, a live Trump is... <laughs> a live debate of those two could be the greatest thing in TV history. Oh, that's... that's all I'm saying is it could be the greatest thing. I that's actually right. think oh. that I think Biden will punch him. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm picturing. Think... Have you seen the uh, that video that was? It's gone around a billion times, but it's some reunion of an old hockey league in Canada. And the old guys are, you know, 80, 90, and they had a rivalry back in the day. And when they were taking the picture, the one guy just sort of put his fist up to the other guy. And the dude just 
bashes him in the head with his cane, and then the dude that was <laughs> playing just one, two punches him to the ground. That's what I. That's what I picture every time I think about that upcoming debate. And then I try to imagine who would make uh, Android Mike Pence head explode. <laughs> Was it, I, I heard is it Klobuchar? He's he's currently um he's currently wooing as he's running mate. She's is that right? she's one she's one of the people being considered. He, but right before he told that good. guy that if you don't like him you're not black, he said that he's considering many, many women. I think he I think he has like uh I think he has to have like a black woman. Well he said or, that. That's the only reason I asked is like, like he specifically said that. He's, like when he got the nomination, he said that the as part of his well, not that that means anything, <laughs> you right. know, like at all. Not, right. not that the politicians keep their word, uh, but I, he basically said that you know my that my uh, VP will be uh, a black woman or a woman of color. I think is what he said. So oh, uh, he had a he was on a uh, on the Talking Head shows with and Stacey Abrams was brought on, mm. and uh, the host was like. So uh, you had Stacey Abrams brought on. Was there something you wanted to say to her? And <laughs> uh, uh, I think he was fishing for thinking that he, he was going to announce her as his VP. And then uh-huh. he just he just kind of starts droning on like, "Oh, she's a great person." And it, you can you can visibly see the smile on her face go from a hundred to zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, her um, oh. uh, Kamala the cop. Uh, <laughs> Come on, I would watch a movie called Kamala the Cop. <laughs> I'd rather totally. see her debate Trump than Pence, though. Uh, yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, Warren, but she's not. I, I don't remember him saying he would definitely pick a woman of color, but I remember him saying definitely a woman. I, I think after... I thought the woman like of color was time. his Supreme Court, his next Supreme Court. Uh, maybe, maybe. After he keeps uh, sticking his foot in his mouth lately, I think he's probably going to have to. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen he's, the T-shirts uh, for sale on the Trump campaign website? Oh, uh, yeah. You ain't black. Yeah, you ain't black, <laughs> Joe Biden. <laughs> for, he, for just yeah, $30. it's, you know, I've got many issues with that fucking man, but he doesn't understand that it doesn't matter how you, like, how you, how you say it. It's what you say. Yeah. And he is giving soundbite after soundbite after soundbite. There's also that commercial with the, the thing that he said. I don't. I don't even remember the speech because I ignore him as much as I can. But we're <laughs> we're talking about facts, not truth, or truth, not facts. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, dude, you yeah. don't say shit like that. <laughs> I mean, I, but the the thing is, like, not to totally. This is the weird thing. This is the world that I've been placed into. Like, there's plenty of people that go around there apologizing for what Trump means to say when it comes out of his clearly uneducated fucking crater in his face. You know what I mean? Where he says things and people are like, well, actually, this is the whole, like, like inject yourself with disinfectant. He never actually fucking said that. Right, granted, what he did say was equally horrendous and made no fucking sense at all. But he didn't actually say, inject yourself with, you know, disinfectant and we're going to get light inside your body. Uh, you know, he didn't, those were not the words. So yes, that's you can take away from that because that's heavily implied. But that is not the exact context. You can almost pivot the same way to Biden, where he's saying we're talking about the truth and not facts. Like, a fact to someone might not necessarily be truth. The definition of the word fact is the same thing as truth. But how people decipher truth or... What what was the um, thing we said, the horrible fucking Kellyanne Conway said, right? Alternative alternative facts? Alternative facts, facts. yep. Right, so in a world where people are talking about alternative facts, you want to maybe double down on the fact that you are in favour of the truth and not facts if you're dealing with people that decipher things as being, you know, alternative facts. So I can kind of see, but in the context of what he said, it sounds fucking ridiculous. But 
when you spin it out into the world that you're in, it's not the worst thing that's been said. I would argue that him, you know, threatening some poor guy on the campaign trail to go down <laughs> is probably the thing we should be. Well, that's what we should be kind of focusing on. Not not the bit where he, you know, he, he clearly makes a bit of a gaffe and and, he, and that's the thing about like he, I was thinking like because people are like he's clear, like the last four years he's went right off the cliff. And I was like, I'm gonna go back and you know check some. I checked some of his speeches when he was VP, and they're equally unintelligible. <laughs> you like know what I mean? He's still talking shit back then. So the thing is, uh, like, uh, these are the things that people talk and argue about, but really, no one, no one cares about this. <laughs> like, uh, like it, I think when the election comes, it's basically uh, people. Who, hate Trump will vote against him. People who love Trump will vote for him. And then yep. none of any of this, like people aren't really mad about when Biden said, or when Trump says something stupid. No, no. I think, I think you're spot on with that. I think for the, the, the outrage that comes from the media is a, a kind of, uh, is almost an echo chamber for their readers and their viewers, but your general Joe on the street uh, will will either think, yeah, Trump can run another four years, or no, I've had enough of him. Um, I, you know, I, I'll go with the other guy, uh, and that's that's the problem with having just a binary system that way, or of one or the other, or well, it's not even a binary system because you can choose to sit out, but. Um, which a lot of your people do. Like American voter turnout rates are low, <laughs> fucking but, super low. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, That's uh, why. It's like the people who were uh, the people who were upset about uh, the grab them by the pussy comments. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, suddenly not, suddenly not that mad about it. Yeah. When it comes to Biden. Yeah. It's it's as weird as like the so a weird I I think if anything that's the that's been the interesting thing that's come out of the the kind of four year Trump presidency is that I think it has really solidified um, the ideas that a lot of people have about the place and role of media um, and where you choose to like take your facts from or your your truths from <laughs> um you know I, I think it's really leveled down into that and to be honest the good journalists have have kind of risen to the top <laughs> you know what i mean and the really bad ones have been i think shown for i mean they've not lost anything but they've been shown for being as bad as they are like when they talk about doing like a super cut clip of all the things that trump has said since he went into office and what he's actually delivered i think people should be doing exactly the same with your rachel maddows your fucking tucker carlson's you know like the the, the full thing they should be doing it with all of them um, and say, yeah, this guy is a fucking horrible, horrible, horrible man that's in charge of your country, and he's he's a fucking buffoon right now. But these are the people that are critiquing him. These are the people that are holding his feet to the fire. And let's look at their su super cut clip for the last four years, because I'm telling you, no one is coming out smelling the roses at all. It's yeah, like, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> cable news is just uh, it's kind of just like a clown show for ratings. Yeah. yeah. It's who can who can shout the loudest essentially. It's like podcasting. <laughs> it's like podcasting on the midnight horror show. Uh, it's whoever can shout the loudest to get the <laughs> two minutes of time to crack the joke that probably won't resonate with everyone. Speaking of podcasting, when are you guys gonna get some of that Spotify money they're throwing around? What the the Rogan money? Like, <laughs> yeah, Rogan. One hundred million dollars for exclusivity for I think it's like a three year deal. I don't even think it's like it's not a massively long deal. And all that means is he has to just make sure that by the end of the year he's not publishing his show on YouTube and it's taken down off all those platforms. Kind of similar, but obviously worth a whole lot more than what the guys at last podcast on the left did with their deal, which was I think was worth a couple of million. Um, so yeah, it's fucking nuts. <laughs> like, absolutely. <laughs> the thing is, I listen to Joe Rogan. I'd like not every episode, but I think he's a great he's a great um, example of a guy that interviews everyone. Like so, like one like one day you could be hearing nothing but scientists and nutritionists talking about things, and then like two days later, fucking 
some weird like right wing political commentator or left wing political commentator and then like a comedian who makes their living off dick and fart jokes you know that can all happen in one week so I think he hits like a huge huge demographic there is a reason he's the number one podcast in the world so and that comes with a price tag um, but yeah he's making bank like he's like so hundred million Jesus he's Christ. so fucking it's a hundred million for sitting in a studio that he owns outright and talking. 100 million to talk. You name one, one Fox pundit, one fucking, you know, CNN pundit or anything like that, that is making even remotely close to a quarter of that in three years, and I will be impressed. Yeah, yeah it's seen where uh, his, his downloads, like the, I guess, like the average listener or viewer, on mm-hmm. YouTube and whatnot for his show. If you combine them, he gets he gets like many more eyes and ears than you know, like your cable news guys or whatnot. Oh, yeah, combined, combined, and I think that was what the that was where the kind of I'm going to say outrage, but I'm going to say fake outrage that sprung up when he originally endorsed Sanders. People were like you know, can, can we can we can we you know Sanders was like yeah <laughs> look. Joe that, Rogan endorsed me, and people huge. were losing it. Yeah, people were losing their shit over that, and I was like, "Why are you losing? Like, why? Why is that any more upsetting than you know, fucking Robert De Niro saying, you know, I'm going to vote for Biden? I don't, I don't get the, I don't get. He, he's got a huge platform, and he can say that, but I don't vote because other people vote a certain way. I mean, like, you know, what I mean? I'd like. I love Stephen King books, right? But Stephen King told me tomorrow he was voting one way and I disagreed with that vote. I wouldn't vote that way because Stephen King was voting that way. You know what I'm saying? Um, So it's just a guy's opinion. And I think it's just as valid as anyone else's opinion. And he actually, if anything, he actually justified why he wanted to do that. And people were losing their fucking mind. Like, actually losing their mind. And um, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, the DNC got what they wanted anyway. So, I mean, regardless, it didn't make, didn't, it didn't have a huge impact. But I just don't, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It was, it's, yeah. it's hard to believe it was just a few months ago. Like, it seemed like Bernie Sanders had that sewed up. Yeah, it was his. It was right his. before the SC primary. Yep, he was, he was almost there. It was, it was in spitting distance. Um, and yeah, once again, <laughs> it was taken away from. Him. And I'm sorry, right? Fair play to him and, and all the rest. But when he was like, "Yeah, mate," you know, you never say no for the next time. I'm like, just say no. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be you'll be pushing fucking eighty. Just say no, right? Just say no. My girl AOC will be old enough to run next time. Will she? In- yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. At, th- at this point, it doesn't matter. We're uh, we're throwing trillion dollar bills like uh, out there every month. Like, yeah. Oh, we got to make sure that those giant corporations are gonna be okay. Yeah, Jesus Christ! It's like anytime uh, something bad happens, you're like, how are the bankers doing? Did they have enough money? <laughs> when you <laughs> get them some more money? Well, and that was one of the things that. Um, you, you know, after Biden relatively was handed the scepter by the DNC, everybody was saying, OK, now you got to reach out. You got the old people mm-hmm. and everything. Now reach out for all the angry, disaffected Sanders types. So he <laughs> starts loading up his campaign with Republicans and people that handled like the last uh, bailout after the crash of 08. He has since taken on other people uh, and things, but um, yeah. I, I will say I, w- I will say this in his slight defense there, those might be the people that you kind of want in or around you because you guys recovered not that badly from post-2008, you know what I mean? So you might want those people in there. Yes, it's not going to... But let's be honest. Can you... Right, see, if I asked you right now, could you name all the key players in the Trump administration? No. <laughs> like, could you name them all in the Obama one? I think you could probably name a good few of them, but I, I doubt you'd be able to name them all. And, I, I mean, it's, it's not been since... Fucking, I think Bush was maybe the last one where you could, like, you you knew who was where, roughly. Um, 
these people are not, no one cares about that. You know, it's only the media that that really report you. Know, well, this guy, you know, is, uh, he worked with Goldman Sachs and like all, all these things. All that stuff is like Obama walked out of office fairly squeaky clean, and all the people that he appointed were right from the financial sector. So, um, you know, you know, like people don't. It's, it's the initial outrage of it's whatever can get a headline to get someone's blood boiling, and then. You know, see if Biden just puts in people that can do their job. I mean, that's a step in the right direction. I think that's all you really need now is people that <laughs> actually want to do the job. It seems like, like a, seems like a big selling point for a lot of people. Like, uh, well, Biden surround himself with uh, with good people or whatnot because yeah. uh, uh, the everyone knows his his brain is gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you want that. You really want that. You really, you want people, you want people that that can like that can decipher crazy and you know, like, you know what I mean, and, and be able to go off. Well, you know, yeah, I mean that's not what he said, but we know what he said. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think that's why his uh his VP pick is gonna be important for a lot of people oh, because because they just, he's probably not gonna make it. Well, and he he also <laughs> said that his he might pull right like William now, Henry oh, Harrison. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, he he has also said that unless things change, the kind of plan is that uh, he only wants to serve one term. Yeah, they're grooming the uh, you know probably the vice president. Then in that in that universe is basically who the DNC is saying they want to be the next candidate. But that to me makes sense. Like you know, what I mean, I I don't I think I think from their perspective, they they did the Clinton experiment and it horribly backfired. Um, and to be honest, had Biden let's 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 call it for what it is if Biden had run, Biden would have got in like last time. I don't think he would have like walked it, but I think he would have got in. So the fact he kind of stepped out the way and Clinton had his had her run at it um, and you know colossally fucking fucked that whole thing up um, and I, I know people will say well she got more votes etc but that's not how your system works so you know, unless you change that that means fucking nothing so can't moan about you can't moan about the result if you can't if you're not prepared to change the system. So anyway, um, he, you know, he, he was, but at the time they were talking about that anyway, that had he run, it would have been for one term alone and that would have given the opportunity for the the Democratic Party to position things in such a way where they would get someone, whoever it was, someone preferably younger, up to, up to speed, um, you know, do the correct vetting and all the rest to make sure that, you know, they don't fucking drink the blood of small infants or something um <laughs> or whatever qualifies these days i don't know uh you know, and, and, then, and, and i don't think anyone really cares about that either yeah well i think if anything, <laughs> i think like, the, the the beauty of the once again the beauty of the whole trump thing now is that like the the lack of outrage on the republican side to all the things that have come out of about trump have basically negated every argument that they potentially will have moving forward. So adultery, that's going to be fine. You know what I mean? Like because Trump did it, so that's that's going to be fine. You can't argue that now because your guy did it. Your guy's recorded I, doing it, you know, and has paid off people not to talk about it. Um, so yeah, you know I mean? like I, I kind of <laughs> like that that he like uh you know like uh, JFK. Like everyone knew he was banging like Marilyn Monroe and all these other chicks, but it was. It was under the, you know, no one really talked about it uh, out out front. But then <laughs> they asked Trump about, uh, did you bang this porn star? Like, yeah, she has a horse face and uh, she can't keep her mouth shut. <laughs> Here's me and her with my pregnant wife. We're going to Jeffrey <laughs> Epstein's party. It's so it's so blatant. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. All these small things, which I'll be honest with you, like it's always been. And to me, it's always been slightly disingenuous to sit there and say, well, this guy or this woman had an affair, so they can't hold their office anymore. Why? Because <laughs> they, they couldn't keep it in their, their pants? Is that, is, that what, is that how you judge whether someone is good at their job or not? You know, it's this whole idea of 
yeah, beyond reproach and un, you know unattainable values, which you know like are above the pale. All this nonsense, and, and essentially he's eroded all that. Very, very. He's eroded it very much like a xenomorph erodes metal when it's you know shot. <laughs> Uh, and with that noise as well, like, <laughs> like kind of thing. that's basically what he's done. And all those arguments are gone. And that is great because if I have to look at Mitch McConnell sit smugly talking about someone having an affair uh, and not being able to, like, that, you know, like all those things are gone now. Congratulations. Because you did nothing about it. What, uh, what is this that McConnell was doing recently? He's trying to sneak in some spy shit. He's always something? trying to sneak in some spy shit. Oh, the, the FBI reading your search history without a warrant thing? Yeah, yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah, that, that was That's it. Uncle and Mitch. I got passed. And he just, uh, I think he just confirmed a QAnon guy. <laughs> this one's going to have to fire Bernie's computer in a second. Go see it, <laughs> I just, I just need to get rid of my computer, Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, I think that's an extension on the Patriot Act, because that also just got renewed. I need to get a flip phone. Uh, that and yeah, the the new head of uh, the new DNI who took over. There hasn't been a official DNI since two thousand eighteen, two thousand nineteen. They finally got around to confirming some QAnon guy. Nice. Oh, uh, I have a question about this. What the uh -oh. fuck is QAnon? <laughs> How do, you, how do you not know what QAnon is? I, I hear about it all the time, but I'm, like, I have no idea Donald what Donald Trump is their savior. He's yeah. playing seven-degree fucking international grandmaster chess. But um, did you not I... know that he's he's in there busting up this massive international pedophile ring? Yeah, like like Donald the, Trump, the that's why he got elected. And stuff. Yeah. So yeah. Is, is QAnon, is it like a 4chan for Trump? It's... Yeah, QAnon is yeah, it's kind of like a, a QAnon is it's it's not even like yeah, it's like it's like for Trump, but it's not like it's not specifically for Trump. It's like it's all built on conspiracy, but their their poster, their poster head or figurehead of the whole thing is Trump. That they believe, whether they are trolling or not, and I would lean more towards the troll than anything else. But they believe that Donald Trump is secretly. Uh, his whole goal of getting into office and doing the things that he's done in office is because he is a mastermind that is exposing the paedophile ring conspiracy at the very core of the USA. Yeah. Um, and yeah, all the gaffes he does and all the rest, that's like, but they also post a, a, a ludicrous amount of bullshit. Like they were the ones that were claiming for a while that someone was drugging uh, one of Trump's like 18 cans of Diet Coke that he has a day, and that's why he was starting to look lethargic and you know, he, low energy. You know, yeah, low energy and all the rest. Nothing to do with the fact he's like grossly obese and old. <laughs> he has a terrible fucking diet, and he's clearly on speed. He's clearly on speed. You know, it's <laughs> like, like nothing to do with that. But that was the uh, QAnon conspiracy, which started to make headlines. So. It's a. I get a feeling it will go away if he doesn't get in. Um, I think all, a couple of these things. I don't think they'll fully go away, but they won't get the same amount of press that they're getting. But yeah, it's it's what we like to call and the the casual dabbling of online searches and investigations a lot of bullshit. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, you could spend like you could spend a couple of days going down a horrific rabbit hole trying to work out what it is that QAnon could like that whole QAnon and incel stuff come up about the same time and popularity on the net and it's just weird both of it's weird um there's something about JFK Jr. faked his death and he's gonna come out and help expose things yep uh there was that pizza place that that guy went to with the gun <laughs> Yeah, which uh, turned out fine. I mean, that, he 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 got him some pedophiles, and oh no, that it didn't happen that way. All right, sorry. <laughs> cheese there was pizza no basement. Is, <laughs> is short for child porn. Oh. CP man, CP. There's codes in the retweets. You gotta look. But they're there. Uh, what about what about Alex Jones saying he was going to eat his neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> I am telling you right now, I, I, I have been seriously considering, you know, if things keep the way they are and this country's in lockdown, I will 
In fact, eat my neighbors. <laughs> I will eat your ass. I will eat my neighbor's ass. You're fucking lunatic as well. Uh, uh, oh, I by think... the way, Sean Hannity in 2008 signed a hundred million dollar five year contract. I don't have anything current. Yeah, a hundred million for five years, and that's to be groomed and have to toe the company line. And Rogan can say whatever the fuck he wants and sit in a sauna room and talk about killing elk and eating it raw. Smoking <laughs> pot with like, Elon Musk. Yep, yeah, he he can do that. He just had fucking Tony Hawk on. Tony oh, Hawk he? was on. This. Yeah, Tony Hawk was on this week uh, for two hours and. Like, I, I was like, yeah, because I know he's got the new computer game coming out. Said, um, I was like, Tony Hawk coming out? Yeah, Tony Hawk 2. Yeah, um, they're, they're redoing the old one. It's coming out in September. Yes, he's done. He's filmed a lot of new shit for it and all the rest. So, um, so he's doing the, the tour, you know, the media tour for that. And he was on Rogan for about, you know, two hours just talking. And um, what was interesting about that is I don't think people understand how rich Tony Hawk actually is. Oh, oh, I'm sure he's hella rich. He's, like, he's richer than Rogan by, I would imagine, quite a bit. Um, so there's always that great skit, and um, that's me showing my age. Uh, did any of you ever watch Viva La Bam before uh, Bam Magera lost his shit and became fat like his dad? I, I have seen some of it. I didn't watch it regularly. I thought I thought Bam Margera died. No, he's still alive. He's still it was, it was another one of those guys oh, wrecked good. his car. Uh, yeah. yeah, Ryan Dunn. I, I know he died. Yeah, uh, but they had them. Um, there's a, a one of the episodes on that. They they go to Mardi Gras, and Tony Hawk is with them, and they have a clip at the end, and Tony Hawk spins like a token. It's like one of those tokens that you get on the the chains that you get in Mardi Gras, and it spins around. I think it spins for about like five seconds or something. And then a bit of text comes up and it says the amount of time that that token was spinning around Tony Hawk has just earned $100,000 or something. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's how, that's how insane his revenue was then. And that's early 2000s. People like that don't lose money. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they just earn it. And Hawk doesn't sound like he's spending a lot, if you know what I mean. It kind of sounds like he lives a kind of low kind of a lower i imagine he lives in a, man, uh, a mansion but uh yeah he's he's like he's many many millions over i don't know if darren has the ability to do a bit of a quick google search but i'd be interested to know what his net worth is but i bet you it's in the the hundreds of millions <laughs> I might, might be throwing him a few more bucks for a new tony hawk game oh i, oh, I played the I shit mean, out of that first one i've uh, been playing Friday the Thirteenth nonstop. I think I'm gonna <laughs> that shit. And it's basically just a, uh, it's a like a drawer opening, a drawer and door opening simulator. <laughs> Pretty much. It's not Joe Rogan money, but uh, Tony Hawk's net worth is 140 million dollars. A hundred and he skateboards. What's Rogan worth then? It, he got into, you know, escape. It was like when they said, yeah, sure, George Lucas, you could totally have the merchandising for this stupid fucking movie. So what's, what's, what's Rogan's net worth then? Oh, man. Let's, Let's see. find has out. He already, has he already gotten the money from well, that? Or I he... would, yeah, I would imagine that he'll not get all up front, I would hope. Um, right is... now, right now, Rogan is roughly $25 million. Yeah. That's what I mean. That's insane. <laughs> like, <laughs> Rogan, Rogan is on TV all the fucking time, right? And he's got the the highest downloaded podcast, or uh, you know, in the world. And we're talking about that and all the rest. Tony Hawk skateboards, hey, and they're I, the same uh, age, by the way. They're the same age. The, I heard that guy. Because uh, that's what that guy, on the show. <laughs> heard that guy, Jeff Bezos. I think he's been doing well lately. That's good to see. <laughs> Yeah, I think billionaires made uh, four hundred something more billion more dollars the last couple months, yeah, especially Bezos. Out, yeah, it turns out that even when like horrible shit locks down the world and brings industry to a halt, billionaires will be fine. <laughs> Who'd have known? <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's wealth science. It's like when you deal with wealth science, 
everything goes out the door because it doesn't make any sense. The numbers don't make sense because money's a, an artificial construct anyway. It's numbers on a computer. It doesn't exist. Yeah, if you're a millionaire, you can't go to a bank and say, I would, to, I would like to withdraw my 25 million that is in my account today. Because, <laughs> like, right. you know what I mean? It's, it's, just, it's just numbers on a computer. It's, it's a lot of shit. Um, like, uh, I'm saying that because I don't have any. Um, <laughs> not enough numbers. Not enough numbers. Um, but it's, it's like, it's just a lot. Of but there you go. Uh, there you are, Tony Hawk. And when this new game comes out, that money's going to go through the roof again. Um, but yeah, as as so that he, he was on he was on Rogan's podcast there, and that's that that's why I a long way to get around in a conversation. Um, that's why I mean to me it makes sense for a like spot. I don't know how much money make, uh, Spotify makes off of ad revenue. I would imagine it's quite a fucking bit, and the fact that they have. Like wholeheartedly just said, yeah, we're not just going to do the podcast thing to you know try and get people away from Apple, but we are going to lock in exclusivity with you know big names and big talents in different sectors as well, um, and you know lock them in with us, and then we'll just bring people over because when people start using the Spotify app, um, they'll transfer their Apple Music account over to Spotify because you want it all in one app. Uh, and that just makes sense. Uh, it's, it's a very savvy, very smart move, but it's the whole, it's like the Netflix thing. <laughs> you just like, you're just yeah, throwing yeah. money at stuff, like throwing their, them away. Their model seems exactly like Netflix because, like, I, I've heard they're, they're kind of losing a ton of money right now, but so that in the future they'll have they'll almost monopoly status. And then yeah. you, that's, that's when you make the dollars. Yeah, that's you. Do you, you, do, do you want some Spotify numbers? Go for it. All right. Uh, Spotify roughly makes six point eight billion dollars a year in revenue. Uh-huh. They make six hundred and fifty to seven hundred million on ads. Yeah. So that's that's about ten percent. So that's not losing money at all already. <laughs> 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 so it's like I'm no economist here, but that just sounds like they're losing money. <laughs> <laughs> now that's of January. I don't know if the uh, the pandemic has somehow made people listen to Spotify less, but I don't. I don't... Uh, imagine so. I wouldn't imagine so. I would imagine that's went the other way. <laughs> yeah, it's just a matter of time before Amazon buys them anyway. That's like I, I read that Amazon's looking to buy is it AMC. Oh really? So, like, the the movie yeah. theater or the channel? Yeah, the, the 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 movie theater chain, looking looking to just get that acquisition done and out the way, and then you know you know what that's that's them in the cinema market, and then that's a good step for them, and then they can just keep doing what they're doing. <laughs> like it's like a slow takeover of absolutely everything. And it will eventually become like Blade Runner at the end of our lives, where just it's just massive conglomerates battling each other. <laughs> <laughs> Sharpen your skates. And we'll all be robots, and that's fine. Um, <laughs> I, I can live with that. I can live with that. I don't know. It's weird. It's a weird thing. And like, in terms of like, because both of you guys are in different states. Uh, are you getting mixed messages where you are about the whole COVID thing? Is it yeah everything's okay? Get back out in the world, or is it lockdown still? Or uh, what, what, what's it, what's the sitch? Uh, I'll I'll go second. Smoke, you go first. Um, I don't know. Right right now, I kind of just do whatever I want. <laughs> Except <laughs> I, I, there's the two things that I want to do most. I cannot do. I cannot go to a minor league baseball game. I think. They're talking about all that is just done this year. Uh-huh. And I cannot get on the goddamn Fury 325 because uh, Carowinds is located in North Carolina and South Carolina. Mm-hmm. So we North Carolina is kind of fucking around. If it were completely in South Carolina, I would be on that. Well, Seems like an, S- <laughs> <laughs> like an SC, like uh, we're kind of over all that. Or, you know, just done with uh, <laughs> the bullshit, the closings and all that. What about you, Dan? We're getting a bit of a mixed message. Uh, the The governor of Ohio uh, started, I mean, back in, I think it was the first weekend in March. He started sh- canceling shit like the, 
Arnold Schwarzenegger Fitness Classic is here every year. Uh, forget how many thousands Drugs. of people come for that. He canceled the huh? Nothing. Okay. Uh, he... no, for, a, for a bodybuilding competition, you need a lot of drugs. <laughs> People are not thinking about it, how it impacts the entire economy. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to work at a bar near there. You'd be filled with red-faced tourists in gym shorts carrying around bags of free samples, angrily mm. demanding whatever sort of shitty beer they were into at the time. Um, <laughs> free yeah, samples, get... you see. <laughs> Free samples of muscle milk and protein powder. <laughs> and I'm not sure yeah. what else. But um so yeah, he, he shut that shit down to spectators, and then a lot of the co- competitors didn't go. And then uh, I think March thirteenth is when he, you know, canceled everything. And then it was a couple weeks later that you could get well, I don't know if you ever actually had to stop for more than a week, but restaurants could start selling carryout food. Uh, <laughs> this weekend is when restaurants are allowed to reopen inside if they've adhered to all of these new things that the health department has set up with changing seating and stuff. I don't know what they're going to do about the air conditioning and the air circulation and that, but... Mm. Uh, you know, plastic partitions in places. It was, uh, it was a requirement that you had to wear a mask to go into stores until a couple people showed up at the state house with guns and said, no. So he said, well, businesses can say you can't come in without a mask, but it's not a requirement to wear a mask and businesses can't be sued for saying that you have to wear a mask, but that, you know. Uh, bars reopened last weekend with only outside service if it was also the whole social distancing stuff. But then, you know, seven places got tagged for just having mosh pits full of people drinking Bud Light. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Time to open the pit. Yeah. Uh, on the, on the uh, let's see, the zoos are closed. The museums are still closed. All the kids camps and things are closed i think pools are reopening but they've got some sort of new thing movie theaters are closed but the drive-in theaters are reopening if the cars are a certain distance apart and there's going to be somebody at the bathrooms which sounds was like it, a was the uh was the uh, most important place in ohio opening back up cedar, cedar point, point. <laughs> <laughs> i will let you know as soon as i find out but right now uh, what uh, what uh, uh, they're still doing press con they were doing daily press conferences with uh the governor lieutenant governor and uh dr acton who heads the health department and uh, now it's every once in a while but it's like we're loosening up all these things but with rules i, I do a shitty impression of them it's like but we're asking that you still do all the things that were requirements, but now they're not requirements. So we're just trusting in the basic decency of humanity to look <laughs> out for other people than just yourself. So, <laughs> yeah. Did you, did you see this uh, this Fauci uh, statement yep. yesterday where uh, he's like, no, uh, these uh, long lockdowns, they can uh, cause irreparable damage and such. I was like, yeah, but you weren't fucking saying that like a month ago. This guy, I don't, I don't know. Like he, uh, when the wind blows, he he changes his mind on things. Well, I, you got to tell the line to keep is, your job there. Um, yeah, but I also think science is not like there is no there is no definitive timeline on. There's too many variables. What you can do is you can give out well, best advice on that day, but that will change day to day. I think that's that's the like from. Not to go like overly defensive with him, but I think he he clearly said a lot of stuff at the beginning, like so so isolation, all the rest. People have not been doing it like on the it degree be, uh... that he probably should have, and you you're still playing a guessing game, and people are still moving around, and it's still transferring, and you can only guess how long something will take, and when it moves out, that no one, I don't think anyone expected. 
like things to be as long as they are. I mean, the way Scotland is looking just now, we're um, we are a, we have a, a four phased plan for kind of moving forward. Uh, we're moving into to phase one of that as of next week, which means you can. You know, do outdoor outdoor activities like oh, I've mentioned a loads of fishing, golf, and whatnot. You can meet loved ones, but not inside the house. You have to meet them outside somewhere. Um, but things like you know, uh, you can get de- uh, delivery service and takeaway service, so like drive up service and whatnot. But you can't eat in a restaurant or, or things like that. Those are all still closed. Um, and that's they're going to assess that every three weeks. And if things start to continue to look the way they're going, the next phase from that will be we're going to open some restaurants up. We're going to allow you to go and visit, um, you know, loved ones uh, and, and homes, all this stuff. But there's a, a phased approach to how they're doing it. That is in stark contrast to how England are doing it. And we're, we're neighbours. <laughs> like, uh, they're pushing well ahead and their numbers are not coming down where Scotland's are um, but they're just pushing it. there's no way to one of my favourite things I read by kind of crazy left and right wing people in in the in the Americas uh, when this whole thing kicked off and I was talking to a friend of the show Bo Ransdell about this yesterday was I read all these comments about people praising Putin um, because Russia very, very, very quickly locked down their borders and all the rest. And this is what we should be doing here. If Trump just had the power to lock down the borders, everything would be fine. He should just done it, all the rest. Russia now has, what, the second or third highest count of COVID in the world? <laughs> like, I yeah. like, locking down borders does fuck all. If one person has it and comes in and gets in the right place, it spreads. There's no way you can anticipate that. It's not like, like the thing, you know what I mean? You can't sit and type <laughs> in a computer and it's like total world population annihilation three days. You know, like and that's not how things work. So like what's what's the uh what's the cat was out of the bag? Like uh COVID was everywhere. Yeah. Lockdowns were just kind of pointless, I think. Like uh at first they they estimated uh there were the models that estimated that in the US there'd be like two and a half million deaths or something like uh the lockdowns were first to make the uh not to overwhelm the hospital system that's exactly what they're used for yeah but then that that never really happened and then you had hospitals closing and furloughing uh people left and right and then so then they shift the goalposts and i i never knew like i they want to keep the numbers down flatten the curve but but it was it was never going to go away and it was never no. going to overwhelm. No. Like it's like in we know the demographics of the people that it affects. Yep. But outside of protecting those people, the lockdowns are just it's a it's a case of it's a case of making sure your your health services are are not over overwhelmed. That is literally all lockdown. Lockdown will not annihilate because if you've not had it and you come in contact with someone six months from now, you will get it. Um, and it's not going to go away until there's a cure found. And even then, it's still not going to go away. You're just going to be cured of it. So it's basically, they have numbers of how many medical personnel they have, how many they can put in, how many hours these people can work, uh, how many facilities they have and what their capacity is. And they do a calculation on that. And that calculation is this number cannot go above this number here or we are overwhelmed and we can't, you know, we can't treat people and whatnot. And that yeah. is purely, that is purely what lockdown is for, is to make sure that number doesn't go above it. It's the, the flatten of the curve thing. It's not, it's never going to, and I think that's the worst bit about the communication, regardless what country you've been in, is that the the communication of flattening a curve, I think people will think that flattening the curve is curing the problem, and it's not curing the problem. No, I think, what it's I doing think is, a lot it's, of people think that, uh, lockdowns mean it will go away. Like yeah, it, no. All all it's doing is it's instead of it's 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 instead of getting everyone getting it in the space of a month, and you know doctors not being able to to give everyone the right amount of attention that they need to, it extends it out over a much longer period of time. But it means that those people should, in theory get access to the correct treatment, care, et cetera, et cetera. And that is literally all lockdown does. Um, it's going to be with us for a lot. Like, like people, you know, like, I can't wait for this whole COVID thing to be behind us. 
well, set your calendars for like 2022, because that's, you know, that's how, like, before like, we're talking about no more reporting cases or anything like that, and countries are manipulating their data ridiculously in the UK. China the has zero new cases. Yeah, that's one of my favourite. But like, when you see like in the UK the the death report that they give out because we have a death report, um, that they give out at their daily briefings is not the actual number of deaths of people that have died by COVID. It's short. It's short by about what is it, like twelve thousand, thirteen thousand in the UK. Um, but they don't report that number. Uh, they report a different number and then they justify the report of the different number. Um, and even the graphs, they've stopped showing the graphs at, at the meetings because um, they just don't want to do it anymore. And that, weirdly enough, started happening right after the UK overtook every other European country. We're an island. Like, this should have been, we should have been New Zealand in this equation. Things should have, like, things should have been okay here. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> But you know, it's what, what I like to say is it's really interesting that when you look at the top what five six countries in the world that have the most cases are the ones that are led by people that didn't act correctly in the right manner and you could argue are run by arseholes. Um China, Russia, Brazil, America, the UK. Like I, I I'm of the opinion there was no way to act correctly. Like it, it was, it's just gonna be there. Yeah, you could you could make sure that you're you could make sure that when this thing was recognised as a pandemic, you were already putting in place contingencies for things like ventilators and equipment, which your country didn't do and my country didn't do at all. America sold they just a bunch like, yeah, out of gonna, country. Yeah. <laughs> you make yeah. some bank, motherfucker. You see that wave? That wave ain't here yet. Let's sell this shit. In in uh, NYC, that was I mean NYC is like the hit part and they never ran out of ventilators and i think they're yeah they're they're giving them away to other countries now but uh but that's that's what you're supposed to do you know what i mean like it was always gonna it's always gonna be bad like regardless what you did but you can you can prep correctly and you know what you can do You you can prep correctly and you can stand on a stage and not tell people that it's a hoax. Like, as the national figurehead for your country, that people actually listen to, whether you agree with him or not, he is the, the leader of the free world, and he stood saying it was a Democrat hoax, the numbers weren't real, there would be 12 deaths, if there was any, and it would be gone in a month. And people will take that as fucking gospel. And that's the, like, regardless how quick the government acts or whatnot, if you've got a guy sitting there saying, oh, listen to this, like, these guys are going to tell you it's bad, but it's not bad. It's all a hoax. It's not real and all the rest. People will not take... Like, because he's the president. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's telling you that. People are not going to take the advice of a governor from a different party. God forbid I listen to a fucking Democrat tell me that the president of the United States says this. All you're doing is you're just forcing people into situations where they could be getting something and then visiting people that are vulnerable. Like, because I know what you're saying, the majority of people will get through it fine. But if you're visiting elder relatives, or you work in an industry oh, where people older people are vulnerable people, you are literally a petri dish for death. Um, yeah, there's, so, uh, with like the uh, the hardest hit places here is like, well, at least in Michigan, New York, and I think Pennsylvania, it's come out that the governors have forced uh, nursing homes to, like previously, to take in COVID patients. Yeah, it's the that's, highest rate of deaths. <laughs> the highest rate of deaths in the UK have all been care homes. In fact, there was one we were reading one about one last week. Um, it was a care home on I want to say it was a Scottish island, maybe like the Isle of Skye or something. Um, and there was like it's like 50, 60 residents all dead, <laughs> wiped out the whole facility, cleaned it out. Um, and you know what I mean, like, but that's <laughs> you know what I mean that, that like. I, I, granted, it was always going to be here and all the rest, but you know what you can do? You can take it seriously and put forward a serious message. And I, I, I just don't think... that's That, to me, is the, the bit that was always going to be the issue. It's not the, the, the clowning around like Donald Trump is really good at and the mixed messages and the you know trade wars and all the rest. If you are a, for the most part, single policy politician and you ride in on a wave of populism... 
you are not trained, you are not experienced, and nor can you handle situations out with the purview of that remit. You know that remit of a build the wall. You know, I, I build the wall, repeal Obamacare, and fucking you know t- tax cuts for billionaires, right? It, it, that's that. It's the wave that he rides in on. Drain the swamp, right? That's the, the wave that he rides in on. And the UK, Boris Johnson got in on Brexit. Well, like, Brexit, I will get Brexit done. Brexit will get done. Um, and people are like, yeah, yeah, and all the rest. And they overlook everything else, which is that that post has responsibility over a lot more than just, and some people would say it shouldn't have, and I would probably agree, um, over a lot more than that. And then what you end up with is, fucking Johnson was in, <laughs> he fucking got COVID. He was in a hospital on death's, death's door because he's a fucking moron and ill-equipped. And people are like, oh, you know what? And maybe it's a, you know, maybe it's a shame that, you know, he's landed, the, the worst possible time he's landed this prime minister post, you know, he got me prime minister. And then this, I feel sorry for him because COVID's landed on him. That, that, w- welcome to the fucking job. <laughs> like, being the leader of a country means you have to deal with it. Did you just think it was going to be that one policy from start to end? And that's why your vote's serious. Like that's why you can't fuck around with it, um, because you end up putting people in there that go out and call things which are clear, like clear evidence that it is not a hoax, a hoax for what? For what purpose? It saved no one. It did nothing. It didn't. I don't think it's landed on well long term. And if anything, all it has done is create a situation where, granted, these people may have still got it longer term down the road, but it forced a lot of people to die a lot quicker than they should have. No one comes out of this. There is no easy, no country has handled it well. Out with maybe something like a New Zealand, but a New Zealand is a weird situation in that it really is a tiny country and it did just close all its borders pretty much on day one and like quarantined the people that did have it and yeah, there's like minimal casualties at all. That's not you know, that is not the norm for every other country in the world. Um, and they, they have they have benefits to that, but the rest of the world have to deal with real-life situations and real-life examples. And that's where you can't be a fuck-up. You can't be... You can't, have to be on point. You can't d- disagree with your medical advisors live on air. You sort that shit out before you walk out there. There has to be one cohesive message at a podium. There can't be six different voices. That message can be questioned by all means, um, and that's what journalists are supposed to do, but don't. Um, but it has to be a one line, and that's never been communicated. And that's why I think a lot of people over this side as well, and I'm not just painting America with this, that's why a lot of people over this side as well, I think, genuinely think, well, as soon as lockdown's over, it's, you know, life as usual. Life's n- never going to be the same way again. Like, the, the way we consume... Our, our, our retail now is, I mean, the guy, Joe Bigos has, uh, no, Jeff Bigos, Joe Bigos is a director. Uh, Jeff Bigos has, well, this is the best thing that could ever happen to him because, like, any any option of those little mum and pop shops that were holding on for dear life, they're crushed. Everyone's forced to it shop. Is, I think it's estimated over 100,000 so far small businesses that are just not going to come back here. Never going to come back. Yeah. And where do those people go to work? Well, you saw the L.A. Lakers got a small business loan, right? You know, the people that were employed... <laughs> get a job at Amazon. <laughs> Amazon, exactly. Of course, they end up working in an Amazon warehouse. What are you saying, Dan? Sorry, it is your show, sorry. Oh, no, no, <laughs> it's, it's good. I, I, li- I like I to let, let my guests talk the most. But uh, you, you saw that the L.A. Lakers got one of those small business loans, right? It's fucking unreal. There's, there's stories of, like... Uh... I think Ruth Chris, like they had to give it back because they got so much shit. Yeah, the and then, Lakers uh, did too eventually, but they asked for it and they got it. Yeah, they shouldn't even be asking for it. And that's <laughs> what frustrates the fuck out of me is the blatant and brazen corporate greed. You know what I mean? It's like it's like they're not even fucking hiding it. They're just hoping that no one tweets about it. And it's just a dis a dis me on like because we're talking about like Shake Shack got their their check and they handed it straight to what was it they handed it to local businesses to help them or whatnot and I was like well one how did they get that check like no one at the government's like you know what Shake Shack let's give them 10 million no someone in that company applied for it you know someone on their board or whatnot applied for that money 
to begin with. Who is that person? Why are they still in a job? And you know, it's just and the thing is well, that person's doing their job, which is like this is get, get us money. <laughs> so this is, this is how the government can get away with, uh, you know, just giving banks trillions or billions to the huge businesses, is like every time they do that. Uh, cut a check for everyone for twelve hundred bucks. <laughs> yeah, you're paying <laughs> for silence, aren't you? You're paying something. Well, you got a check. You know what I mean? Yeah, did you, like, uh, did you not want to have got that check? Uh, I want the check, but then once you realize that the check, like that twelve hundred dollars, like per person of the U.S., and if you uh, add up what the the overall bill costs of what they're giving to the businesses and everything, the yeah. major corporations, like I don't know, it'll cost you sixteen grand in the long run. Yeah. So it's, I, I saw someone put it this way, like, uh, the government's fucking you and then leaving $1,200 on the dresser. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's true. Like, you, like, oh, um, like they didn't do, there's no stimulus check in, in the UK, but, like, the furlough scheme was implemented really, really fast over here. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, we're just saying, that we're locking down businesses, Things, things will be furloughed out and, you know, we'll make sure that people get money and, uh, uh, you know, through benefits or whatnot. But, yeah, like, I, I, like it's, it's, the, it's the the weirdest, strangest situation. Well, and what I love about this is that you, you, you see, it's after every big crash or every big epidemic, they're like that. It's like, people genuinely, the people, the ones that actually have the power, <laughs> like, you, know, you listeners out there, we all say the same thing that well, why are businesses these big businesses get why are corporations why are we bailing out airlines and all the rest why why are we doing that why why is our money our tax money going that way why is that happening we need to make sure this never happens again and then it happens again <laughs> like, oh, and then it happens these, again so, these these bailouts will I think it's just a way of life now like uh, hmm? oh and no I think they're gonna bail out uh, states who who've been fiscally irresponsible and they can't pay their bills. So now, so now it's going to, and you've got all these companies that they were buying back their own stock and mm. uh, then they weren't prepared for something like this. So they're going to get bailouts is just all of this. You've it, got it politicians started out there. in 2008. Well, probably before then, but you've got politicians out there smoke who are seeing one thing to the press and while they're saying that thing to the press, they're order, you know, it's, you know, it's it's not that bad. People should like, they should keep calm, don't act, act rash. And while they're saying all that stuff, they're desperately selling off their shares. Oh the yeah, yeah. There's you a know, lot of that. It's fucking un unreal, and nothing nothing's going to happen there. That's that's a uh, you know, people are outraged, but he didn't break the rules. You know. Uh, this is <laughs> this is the world you live in, and I'll tell you this is why you you write about bail, and this like leans back into this money is fictional, it's not real, and like if you're a state, what stops you being fiscally irresponsible the next time if ultimately when you get to that position you're just bailed out? Yeah, that's, that's why I've never understood bankruptcy with the corporations like, as well. I mean, yeah, they're just this bad behavior will be rewarded. Yeah, I've never understood that whole bankruptcy thing. You know, I'll, I'll just file for bankruptcy. Right, so what does that mean? Well, it means that I've got bad credit for five years, but then after that, I can do exactly the same thing again. And, you know, I can start a business again. I can, like, employ people again. I can, you know, like, I set up all these fucking schemes again and whatnot, and then I can just do it again. I'll just, like, file for bankruptcy again. Like, the whole purpose, if you are leaning into the capitalistic the way of working is, the whole, the whole purpose of this is that if your business fails, it fails. You know what I mean? If yeah. it fails, that's it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there are winners and there are losers. Yeah, you you rolled the dice, you took a shot at it, you 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 know you have a product. If your product's the best or your service is the best, it will win out or should win out in the long run. Um, not if you're a, a large fucking yeah. multi-billion-dollar corporation who can then just apply for for all this relief and all the rest. That's not fair. Yeah, if you run it, if you run a company into the ground, you don't deserve taxpayer dollars to keep no. you afloat you deserve to just sink and let someone else yeah someone else will take your provide. place yeah. yeah someone else will take your place that's that's how that works like like the, <laughs> if all the airlines went out of business tomorrow 
that yeah, doesn't mean that there wouldn't be airplanes and airlines. Yeah, the, the airplanes still exist. Yeah, and there will be another company that comes along or someone will start something. They will exist again. Like they don't just get that's like they don't cease to exist. You know, what I mean, and, and that's the way economy is supposed to work. And that's not how it works. And government set a, a horrible precedent of just bailing out um, everything. And as a result of that, there is no like there is no incentive for to, for companies to have a rainy day fund for when the worst case scenario shit hits you. Um, you think about seasonal business, right? If you work on in a, an area which relies on seasonal tourists, for example, right? Um, you know, income. What you do is you operate your business from, let's say, April to, depending on where you are in the world, but let's say you run it from April to October. Now, during that April and October, you are, obviously, you're you're employing people, money's coming in, you're buying your goods, you're doing your job and whatnot and that, but there's a percentage of that that's getting put away. And that percentage that's getting put away is to do you through November through to March when your business is shut. That's your rainy day fund. That's your 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 life vest to get you through when your business is not going to have people coming through the door and tourist street. Like every business should have that. Every exactly. business should have a, a slush fund somewhere that if some bad shit happens, you will survive and rain through it for a set period of time. I mean, I, I wouldn't say years or anything like that, but you should have something in place for that. The fact these companies don't fucking have that is mortifying. Yeah, they yeah, should eat I, less avocado I, toast. <laughs> <laughs> Me and I, Jen, I like avocado I, toast. I think oh, uh, I wanted. I wanted to add before we get too far away from it. We were talking about senators and Congress people using information that they get at briefings and saying some bullshit to everybody else while they're selling all their stock. Uh, that made me remember that uh, Dick Burr, the the main guy that is getting focused on. Yeah. Uh, Dick Burr. Uh, that sounds yeah, like an affliction. I think he goes by it. Richard, but I I, call I think him. you get you get creepy for that. I think <laughs> he uh, the the Stock Act was only passed eight years ago to prevent yeah. Congress people from being able to do that, and I think he was one of or the only person to vote against it. <laughs> this, this guy. But he, he's he's uh, standing with his convictions. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the writing was on the wall. Let's be honest here. <laughs> no one should be surprised. It's it's, it's insane. It really is. It, I I just yeah. I don't know. It angers me, but then I I, I try and not think about it. Um, and then I, I I'm soothed for a, a small amount of time, and then something pops up somewhere that reminds me of how colossally rigged the whole fucking thing is. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, well done, Jeff. Well done, Jeff. I'm now, sure. You're, like he must have been like, like I, I just like imagine him like like a James Bond villain, just sitting like Doctor Evil, like in a room where he has like a table that turns over and a map just going that global pandemic, global pandemic, global <laughs> pandemic. Fingers crossed, praying for it when it lands. He's like, everything's coming up, Bigos. <laughs> Yeah, with with this global pandemic though, like the the only way to you know truly be safe or whatnot is to have a healthy immune system. Mm. Unlike Jake Gyllenhaal in the two thousand and one movie, <laughs> <laughs> bringing God it all you. back. <laughs> yeah, I, we've done enough. Oh, wait, so so the, the premise the premise of the movie quite simply, there's not a lot of meat in the bone here. The premise of the movie quite simply is that this overprotective mother. Um, what's to try and keep our world, our, our sunshine? There's another movie. What's the Brendan Fraser movie that? Oh, Blast from the Encino? Past. No, um... Encino Man. When when he lived in the nuclear bunker for a while. Yeah. The Mummy. Yeah, Blast from the Past. I Blast mean. from the Past, right? Yeah. So, the Mummy. <laughs> <laughs> the Mummy Returns. <laughs> the Scorpion King with the Rock. <laughs> CGI Rock, love it. Uh, CGI. And that CGI eyebrow lifts the greatest thing ever. But yeah, yeah. so like, <laughs> who are you gonna say? There's, there's these guys on uh, YouTube. They they're like special effects guys, and they redo that scene, and it actually looks pretty good because like oh. that's the worst CGI scene of all time. It's up there. 
it's up there. It gives it gives uh, Argento's Dracula a run for its money, um, which does oh. use legit like Nintendo graphics in a movie <laughs> like 2010. Um, it's fucking awful. But yeah, so an overprotective mother, kind of deeply religious, doesn't want her son corrupted by the outside world. So essentially, <laughs> encases him in a bubble. Um, so. And then you know, his head full of nonsense that he's, you know, he'd die and and stuff. And he manages to get out, and we follow him on a myriad of different slapstick comedy adventures with extreme caricatures of of people that would only ever exist in two thousand and one movies. Oh, Fabio. Fa- Fabio was in this movie <laughs> as well. Fucking remember when he was a thing. My yeah, favorite. if Fabio was in your movie, then that's it's dated. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that one of the the greatest things ever online is when Fabio uh, gets hit by a seagull whilst riding a roller coaster. Yeah, I forgot what coaster it was, but I I just watched that recently. <laughs> a, did you did you did you laugh quite a lot? Because I do. Oh, I laughed hilariously. Like <laughs> Fabio getting banged in the schnoz by a fucking geese or whatever the fuck is is the height of comedy. Yeah, you've got um, you've got a, a very like dear God Almighty, is she attractive in this? Uh, but Stacy Keebler for all the the old uh, WCW fans out there. Wait, where was Stacy Keebler in this movie? She she plays the working girl. Where working did you, girl, how right. do you not know Stacy Keebler was in this movie? I know Stacy Keebler. I didn't notice her in the movie though. Yeah, this is the tiniest, 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 tiniest little role. Um, it's not particularly long, but once again, she's in there with the the rest of the the, the throng um, of, of different people that show up. And essentially, we follow him. He falls in love. Of course he does, because we need a bit of love in this movie. Aww. Um Falls in love with... What's the... Who's the... Who's the Remember Chloe, Mar- Marley Shelton, uh, Wendy yes. Peppercorn, and uh, who else was she? She was in the Sandlot. She's in Planet Terror, isn't she? Yes, she's the doctor in Planet Terror. Hey, the uh, the stereotypical Indi- Indian guy is he? A, I've seen this guy before. Is he an Indian guy or is, it, is this like a Fisher Stevens? <laughs> I, <don't know. laughs> I I thought he well on Seinfeld he was from pakistan so i don't know where he's from but that do you mean is that his skin color that is his skin color all right <laughs> if, if that's what you mean i forget his name but he was uh he was babu in seinfeld the guy that wags his finger at, at jerry that's the yeah, only thing fisher, I, really I just want to stress here that fisher stevens did not black up for short circuit <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was uh that was fisher stevens actual that, that wasn't was his, his accent, accent that's... but that was his nope. pigment. I mean, not his accent, but yeah, that, no, that's 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 his facial complexion. Yeah. It wasn't uh, C. Thomas Howell. <laughs> <laughs> or, so uh, bad. Yeah. Oh, time has not been kind to that performance either. Um, but yeah, so like, we, we, I'm we're just that joke so bad. <laughs> what about like, like the, the thing about the movie is like. You could do what well, talking about supercuts. You could do a supercut of this movie, which would be like about five minutes long and super entertaining. Um, but as a long form movie, it's just it's one joke that just goes on far too long. I'm so I think I picked this originally. I think this is all my yeah. fault. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Smoke. Uh, I, I don't know if you could hear me under the sound of a bus that you threw me under. Uh, no, I, I mean, I'm going the other way. I expected just to hate this movie, and I there were some moments where I was like generally just laughing a good bit. Oh, it's hilarious, but it's not a good movie. <laughs> no, this, this isn't this isn't Citizen Kane or some shit. Can I ask though? Um, can I interest you in winning five hundred dollar? <laughs> see his face when he's doing it like Gyllenhaal's face actually gets a bit crazy and I kind of laugh <laughs> um, I thought that just, that but, was an improv scene and they kept it was it? apparently another thing go. I found out was there was a musical seven years later a bubble yeah. one musical fuck off yeah there's a I saw that on YouTube yeah, I mean, YouTube there's lots of musicals. You know, there was a Thanks Killing musical, right? And they're yeah, working, they're working on bringing it back. I understand those things. Yeah. 
I, yeah, I understand. I don't understand why they're there, but I understand those things. But I can't understand anyone watching Bubble Boy and going, you know what? This would translate into the medium of song. <laughs> um, like, I just like I don't know it's, the Poontang it's Poonani the... song. Because uh, <laughs> it doesn't go. The thing about this, like when you think about, and I keep I keep using the dude where's my car kind of reference point because. And like I always intrinsically link those two movies together in terms of the kind of you know it's a slapdash journey from one place to another, picking up ragtag characters to lead to a ludicrous ending. Um, and you know, like what one has the more egregious kind of we're going to take one step into the, the the zaniness? Is it Bubble Boy with? Like the understanding that we've got this half witted character who's going to stumble across some of the furious and shady characters through his journey and not be stabbed or killed or raped, let's be honest. It's a cruel world out there. Or, <laughs> or, did where's my, or, did Where's My Car, where aliens appeared in that movie? We are hot chicks. <laughs> what I, one I've is more egregious? <laughs> never seen it. Where's my car? No. Cue up there, and that's the next one. We'll talk about corporate theft. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that works. Well, that's... <laughs> what did you do with your stimulus check? Well, I bought a car that was stolen. Um, dude, where's my car? It's terrible. It's so bad. Oh, it's one oh, joke. Man. All the way through. And it's got, there are, we, yeah, we can even throw in some parallels because there's the cult with the weird clothes. Yeah, there's the Asian voice and then. Yep, at the drive in. Yep. No, and, and then. then. <laughs> yeah, it's the same fucking movie, man. Or that came out the year before, right? That's that came out in 2000, about right? The same thing. Yep, they had to come out about the same time because I always relate them as being. Yeah, <laughs> like the the same movie, uh, <laughs> for lack of a better uh, better analogy. I always think that they are the same movie. They are not, they're clearly not, but um, I, I think this movie's a lot like uh, Follow That Bird. Have you seen that? With Big Bird, no. When he gets yeah. adopted out to the weird family, yeah. <laughs> I've definitely seen that movie. Do Do you want a bit of trivia that will make you laugh? <laughs> Yes. One of the the because this will explain a lot of choices in this movie. One of the co-writers of this movie uh, has directed a bunch of Blink One Eight Two videos, music videos, <laughs> which will explain Wait. why there's so much Blink One Eight Two in this fucking movie. Yeah, that that one song plays ten times. Yeah, uh, damn it! Not oh, damn yep. it. Uh, he directed. Was... Damn it! So <laughs> I was kind there of disappointed because. In the trailer, there was New Radicals, and I felt yeah. like I was promised New Radicals, but there was no New Radicals in the movie. Cockney Club and Marilyn Manson. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where I went there. Uh, just went off, off beast. Uh, but these guys, the, the two writers have went on to, you could argue, bigger and better things from Bubble Boy, uh, working on uh, Despicable Me, uh, The Lorax, all the Minions movies, The Secret Life of Pets. So, like, a ton of animated stuff, which makes a lot of sense when you watch Bubble Boy, because Bubble Boy feels like it should have been a cartoon. Man, those Minions movies, they rake in the jack. That's all bank, I'm telling you now. That's, <laughs> that's, some, uh, that's some Rogan money they pull in. <laughs> some Rogan money. <laughs> <laughs> some, some Spotify Rogan money right there. Um, what else did they do? I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm deep diving. What else did the director do here? Oh, of course. The director he took a long break after this. <laughs> I think I think there was an eight or nine year break between films that they directed. Yep. Oh, I, yep. I read like this is like the last. I don't know if it's the first or whatever, but it was the last. Like after this, Gyllenhaal said, "Fuck comedy." Well, could you blame him? <laughs> the thing is, he, he's a very funny guy. I was watching. Uh, but you do a bit of deep dive and you do a bit of search, and I wanted to see if I could find much more in the way of Gyllenhaal sort of comedy roles. And um, I did stumble across, uh, there's a video of him and uh, Ryan Reynolds doing a you know Google search. So it's basically, if you type your name into Google, it, how it auto-populates certain things. So if you write, what, what has Ryan Reynolds? I've seen a few of those. I never saw his. 
Well, it's him and uh, <laughs> it's him and uh, Ryan Reynolds because apparently in real life they're BFFs, which I mean, oh. So dreamy. Um, and uh, back part two. <laughs> you know, but they, they, <laughs> brought back DP. Um, so <laughs> just saying. Um, but yeah, so they're, they're, they're doing that, and Jim Earl's like fucking wickedly funny, like a very, 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 very funny guy, and I think he would probably be really good. And kind of kind of more indie-ish sort of comedies, kind of thinking maybe along the lines of your how you would cast someone like a Joseph, Go- Joseph Gordon Levitt in a kind of indie comedy. Um, but no wonder this turned him off. Like he is like the most obnoxious character in this movie by quite some bit, <laughs> and we have to spend all our fucking time with him. <laughs> I, I, I thought he was all right, except. Uh, his hair kind of bothered me a lot. Yeah. Not his acting. Not his acting. Like, his acting's fine, but, I mean, as a character, would you be friends with the Bubble Boy? <laughs> Smoke. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, yeah, well, he's, like... So this chick, she must have a fetish of some some type. Yep. Because uh, when she first walks in there, he's in a bubble, and then he's uh, screaming some nonsense. <laughs> and that's... And her immediate uh, thoughts are like, God, I want to get this dick in me. Yeah, crazy attracts crazy. <laughs> <laughs> what were you saying, Duncan? I said crazy attracts crazy. And also okay. she's thinking there's absolutely no way I'm getting pregnant with him weird than that. You save money on rubbers. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> ain't, I, no, ain't no raw dogging if you're a bubble boy. I think he does. He, he is a, an annoying character. But I, I just think of it at the base of he's the product of a recovered what was what what was her name when she rode with uh, Danny Trejo wildfire, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who who finds Jesus and becomes a Reaganomic nut job and she's got him in her fish tank. But isn't that what? But th- to be honest, that's I mean that's a, like obviously a stereotype for the, the character, but there are. That's the that is the thing, isn't it? That you find that, and once again, not to do sweeping generalizations, and I do apologize if this uh, offends you, but isn't that the thing? Like when you're like you tend to find that people that are quote unquote conservatives uh, and have conservative values tend to be like tend tended to be people that purged a lot of that shit out of their system when they were young, all the crazy shit. <laughs> like yeah, the, uh, there's this uh, theory about that I had about. Baptist, which is kind of oh, fucked up. But, uh, but it'd be a, like, you've got, you know, your moderate Christians, you know, but then you've got the hardcore ones. And my theory is that they're like people who at some point hit rock bottom of some type. <laughs> and then they, they have to have uh, this in order to stay on the right side of saying. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, cl- they cling on to it like, like a fucking life vest. And that's yeah. what I kind of love about her character is like once you understand. It's because like I grew up that, Baptist, by the way. All right. <laughs> I'm explaining a lot. Uh, uh, but you, you get that. I went the other way. I went uh, from Baptist to rock bottom. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know. <laughs> you're here with us. That's fine. It's not quite rock bottom. Close <laughs> to the bottom, but not quite. Um, they're, still, they're still a bit still a bit below. But like, once you get that reveal in the movie, it totally makes sense. You know, I mean, the way that she's been acting, the way she's done. I like that. Once again, it's not... It's not the worst movie in the world. It's just it's it's aged horribly. <laughs> like, oh, this movie's nineteen years old, and um, like I watched. And the thing about it is, I watched a uh, American Pie recently because it finally made its way over to Netflix, and um, I still think a lot of American Pie holds up. Um, but there are whole sections in that movie that do not hold up at all. Like, are just. Like borderline cringy, and I'm not saying that because I'm an adult, but the, the, it, it just is. It's a weird time capsule that is not always the most comfortable to look back on. Like with uh, with Bubble Boy, you've got Vern Troyer in your movie, so that's there was like a what like a two year period where he was in like every movie. Yeah. Then nothing before, nothing after. Yeah. So that's definitely gonna date your movie. 
Yeah, but it's just like an actor's references to set, like jokes built on the premise of specific 2001 things, um, you know, which are now no longer even remotely issues. Like, I think you, certain comedies age really, really well, and I tend to find those are the ones that don't purposely try to be hip or relevant to that time period. I mean, a movie like Groundhog Day will always be an absolute fucking classic because the premise and idea of Groundhog Day is it could happen anytime, anywhere. Um, you know, the premise of Bubble Boy couldn't happen anytime, anywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just, it wouldn't make sense. That, that kid would have a computer, he would be on the internet and he would know everything. He would, he would, he would have self-diagnosed. Tony Hawk pro skater. <laughs> he would be, of course. Have an Uber uh, waiting for him by the time he got down the bottom of the stairs. Yeah. It's, it, like I said, it's, like, it's, uh, it's a weird, it is, it's like a weird time capsule or bubble um, of, of a lot of things that I think work against it. And I did, I laughed a lot during the movie, I'll be honest, because I've told you before, part of me still has this completely puerile brain that silly dick and fart jokes do make me laugh way more than they should. Um, it's my undoing, it's my curse. But, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, this is barely a movie. <laughs> like, it really is. It is a series of very funny short one set pieces strung together with a, a kind of road trip um sort of it reminded me of the movie road trip um <laughs> uh, you know what i mean weirdly enough uh, another kind of post-american pie movie with that one also star sean william scott was he in everything at this time he was oh yeah around this time it was yeah. it was sean william scott time yeah, he's like, he's like, he's making that Joe Rogan money. Uh, so, so, uh, but yeah, like, there's all those movies that did the kind of road trip thing. It is basically, it's, and it's an American tradition in movies. The, the road trip movie is just one ludicrous set piece to one ludicrous set piece to yes. one ludicrous set piece. And this one does it in a more, yeah, yeah, it falls right back on that. But it's the this one is the big cartoon version of that, and I think you need to, it's like it's like watching a movie like Freddy Got Fingered. I think that movie <laughs> is absolutely hilarious. I, I've I never seen why. that. You still never seen it. I think it is as close to comic genius as you will ever see in a movie. I also completely understand why I'll, most people think it is one of the worst movies ever made. The uh, the two most prominent movies I've never seen are Freddy Got Fingered and The Shining. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Stephen King will tell you to check out one of those movies and not the other. I'll leave that to you to decide. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm a Stephen Weber fan. I might check it out. Oh, you are a bad man. Troll, troll, <laughs> troll in the dungeon. Uh, but yeah, I think that, I think uh, my biggest takeaway from this was it finished, it flies in. I'll give it this. This movie, like, you are minutes into this and you're on the road. And um, it's it flies right into its ludicrous end. And I said, it makes me laugh. It's not a good movie. It's not, <laughs> like, I, I would never, like, I wouldn't, like, see if my... Like sister in law who is what well, she's just turned she's just turned eighteen. If she was asking for a movie recommendation for a comedy, I would never tell her to check it Bubble Boy in a million years. Um like because I just think it's it, it is a weird, horrible representation of two thousand and one. <laughs> I think comedies are different now. You know yeah, I mean? well, yeah, if you're if you're eighteen now, yeah, maybe not. But eighteen then, I I mean I think you would love the shit. Yeah, well, I was. That's what I'm saying. I was. I, well, I wasn't 18. I was, what, nine, 19? No. What would it have been? 20. Just turned 20 when this movie came out. And, I, like, I loved it. I thought it was very, very funny. That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> like, I can't remember how got on the train, but I was like, we should do Bubble Boy. Because uh, it's really, really funny. And I sat there and watched it, and I did a laugh through it. But, I mean, it's not a good movie. It's really it does not. the kindness of being less than an hour and a half long. Oh yeah, I, I saw that runtime beforehand, and I was like, "This is beautiful." Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, like, because like comedies, even now, comedies are pushing, you know, the the hour forty five mark, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> "This better be some fucking Mark Twain esque fucking comedy." <laughs> Keep me watching for an hour and forty five minutes. 
These these better be like long form, perfectly set up, perfectly executed jokes. Otherwise, I'm gonna be pissed. And this movie does it does it like it it rolls in quick. I mean, you do go right through it, um, but it does like the, cynically. I think it's it's an opportunity to sell CDs and um, for Blink One Eight Two. I'm wondering if Blink One Eight Two and Offspring were on tour together that year. Because it is Must just one or one or the other, back and forth. Just constant all the way through it. I, I, but you, you, it's, it's some of the. Oh scenes. yeah, the the offspring would come up every time the the bikers entered. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Yeah, like it, yeah. Keep them separated. <laughs> Brought me back. <laughs> I've, I've got. I, I will be honest with you. I've got nothing else to say about. But <laughs> we, could, we could just do. We could just do like homages to pop punk songs from two thousand and one, if you want. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I. I think we're we're coming up on the. Uh, you're you're out anyway. Out we are. Yeah, yeah. I I put a time limit on this for your listeners uh, because I know that if I don't put a time limit on these things, one, I will be divorced, and two, we will just talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> we've we've done episodes that I turned into two episodes before. I feel like our longest chat was somewhere. I don't even know if it was over or under four hours. That's ridiculous, but also awesome that we did that. I'll tell you what though, I as I, cause I do feel a bit guilty about cutting this short. I'm going to propose something that I know that I always do and it never happens, but I'm going to propose it anyway. Um, I can't that wait I, three years from now. I think that, I think next month, because we're all in these uncertain times and we, we, we can maybe, I can organise things pretty easy at the moment. Um, maybe what we should do is next month do a little bit of New Jack City. Bum. I've heard of that movie. Yeah. And I've proposed it every single time. And let's do it next then. Let's do it next month. Let's do a June recording. And let's do New Jack City because I bought me a Blu-ray of that when we originally suggested it. And it's still sitting with shrink wrap on it. Oh, yeah. Watch it. So, how about Jack that? City. June Jack City. Love it. Wesley Snipes June is the most underrated American treasure of all time. I think it's an incredible movie, and that's before the rewatch. But oh, then I it's... also thought Bubble Boy was an amazing movie, and that was before the rewatch. So Wesley Snipes also said, fuck the IRS, so he's a double hero in my book. Yep, and he did time <laughs> for it, though. Uh, so... <laughs> I mean, it didn't work out well, but... Yeah. <laughs> he should have incorporated before he said that, and he would have been oh, Exactly. They would have given him money. He would, he would be sitting on a, a, a Rogan-era fucking stimulus check. <laughs> He's another guy that would have been worth quite a lot of money before that. It's always interesting how the, like those guys that are making a lot, a lot, of, like quite a lot of money, all of a sudden are like, yeah, I'm not paying taxes anymore. I wonder, I wonder if him and Nicholas Cage just get together and just bitch about the, the, the IRS. And Nicholas Cage can only ever bitch about the IRS from a working set because he has to make movies until he dies now. <laughs> like, unless you're a co-star, you ain't hear nothing from Nicholas Cage. He can, I think his amount, his allotted time offset a year is like three days. <laughs> <laughs> he's, Always. He, he's been cracking out some gems in the past couple of years. I totally agree. I thought the color uh, space was kind of fucking amazing, and uh, Mandy was my horror movie of the year. Yeah. Uh, oh, Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad is fucking great as well. Mom and Dad is legit great. Um, so he has it in him. It just it was it the I think it was um ah uh, the uh, Panos Cosmotos, the director of uh, Mandy. Uh, no, that's a can't remember um but he basically said that um working with nicholas cage uh, you're working with this just cr- you know, tremendous actor but you just need to give him focus like because if you don't give him focus he will just he gives you the performance he thinks you that he thinks the character should be in the movie and if you don't give him any direction that sometimes means you're going to get crazy cage out of nowhere. <laughs> like, oh, have you seen the uh, Bad Lieutenant movie he was in? I, 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 if you're about to slag that off, we're going to have fighting words, my friend. I, I'm, I'm that. not. I think it's amazing, but I yeah. think he's insane. He's an insane. Oh, he <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like the, no one. 
I don't think any, I think even with a great director, which I want to say was that I can't remember who did the remake. Um, but uh, did Herzog do one of those, or am I just making that uh, up? Abel Ferrara might have done the original, so maybe Herzog did the remake. Maybe he does not know. Darren keep us right. Bad Lieutenant. Um, let's see, the Bad Lieutenant remake was Herzog, right? Oh, and, wow. Yeah, yeah, that was who, Werner Herzog. Was and it? It's Nacho Vigalondo me. did Time Crimes, which I That's don't know why. Right. And who did who did the original uh, Bad Lieutenant? Is that Abel Ferrara? I think so. There's only been two, right? Aside from sequels. Yes. Right? There was two. Yeah, two that, bad was, that was Ferrara. Yeah, that's what I thought. See, between us, we're, 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 we're there or thereabouts. But yeah, like, if you've got Ber- Berner Herzog directing Nicolas Cage, dear God almighty. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I'll check that out 10 times out of 10. Yeah, dear God almighty. Uh, plus, uh, at that point, like, Herzog's not camming the crazy. He's feeling it. He pulled a gun on Klaus Kinski. That's, the, that's one of the most famous Hollywood stories of all time is to try and get Klaus Kinski, who was notoriously, who was the Nick Cage of his time, uh, to do a scene that he had to physically pull a gun on him to calm him down. So you, you know what Werner Ver- Herzog is probably most known for now? It's uh, trying to kill Baby Yoda. And this is the Mandal. I've still to see the Mandalorian. So, <laughs> oh, but I had heard he was in it. When I was in it, was just casting for it. I was like, well, I was going to watch him. And I it's, it's actually really good. So what I hear is it, but is it Last Jedi good? Uh, no, I said it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's right. Come back in June on the Psychosemantic podcast where we'll be reviewing The Last Jedi. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, no, New Jack City definitely has to happen. We'll, we'll make it happen. A month will have passed. We'll see if anything has changed for any of us. Um, I, I mean, we can do all we that. We should do is we should just do something completely different and keep the running joke going of not well, doing. Don't tell them that. Don't tell them that. Edit, edit, edit. <laughs> yeah, don't tell them that. We'll, we'll do something completely different, uh, and then and then they'll keep showing up, thinking they're going to get New Jack City, and they're never getting New Jack City. I never. Can't. <laughs> we'll, we'll do white men can't jump. Um, that's a good movie. Uh, I know yeah. that's a good movie. I don't just throw it shit. I know Bubble Boy is not the greatest example of that, but yeah, I try sometimes. Rosie so, Perez was mighty fun around. No, oh, that was like twenty years ago too. That was longer yeah, that, than that. that was 90s, oh right? yeah. yeah, damn, that's like a quarter of a century. <laughs> <laughs> In the late 1900s. <laughs> you can't jump 1992. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And when, when was Do the Right Thing? Right around then? Or 89, maybe? Uh, right Thing. I was actually going to spell it as Thing, so that's not right. Do the Right Thing is 1989. Okay. She was, uh, she was still hot in that. <laughs> New Jack City is 1991. So Wesley, this is the Wesley Snipe freight train, by the way. Let's, let's just cover this for all the same. This is this is where Snipes made all that fucking bank. Um, listen, that's, that's a tear away fucking train of movies. Um, so get yourself no. ready. Strap yourself in. Like, let's just kick in just 90s, right? So there's uh, King of New York is 1990. I'm just talking about the good movies. Uh, New Jack City is 1991. When was Point Blade? Main... Was it? When was Blade? That was probably like 90s. Oh, that's, 98. That's, that's, that's or 99. 98? Uh-huh. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, I, I want to say it's up there. But we'll, 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 we'll get this. Uh, so New Jack City, 1991. Uh, White Men Can't Jump, 1992. Passenger 57, 1992. Rising Sun with a little bit of Sean Connery, 1993. Demolition Man, 1993. Sugar Hill, 1993. Um, holy fucking shit, actually, when you look at this. Uh, to Wong Fu, which is a personal fave, 1995. <laughs> Money Train, 1990. Money Train would be a fucking great shit, by the way, for this show. Hell yeah, it would. We did murder at 1600 a couple episodes or a couple months ago. Money Train, that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, murder at 1600 was the year after, but he did the year before that. He did the fan, <laughs> Robert De Niro. Go, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's a terrible fucking movie. US Marshals, 1998. Blade, 1998. No, after, after all the time and all of these new Marvel movies, Blade is still the best Marvel movie. Um, I am not going to disagree with that because I love Blade. Give me some Stephen Dorff and I'm a happy man. So, here we go. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Frost. He was amazing. Deacon, Deacon Frost. They we're talking about him coming back somehow um, in the new movie. And I was like, yeah, just made that happen. I don't care how you bring him back. Just bring him back. He's amazing. So, but there we go. Oh. It was as nice as in a Guillermo del Toro movie. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But Stranger Things have happened. He's, he's done. Yeah. Wait, yeah. He, he makes a brief appearance a uh, season or two ago in What We Do in the Shadows also, if you're not up on that. Damn, does he play a vampire? Because I had no idea about this. I'm not going to say. That the, is that the episode? Well, I can't talk well, too much. No, yeah, it. we could say. It, it's at least uh, a season or two back. Yeah, I think, isn't isn't it, there's a, I've heard that there's an episode where all these different interpretations of different on-screen vampires all attend a party would it be in that it's the vamp yeah 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 and he, he shows up i can't i need to watch this i, I keep meaning to pull the trigger on it yeah it's just been I renewed that movie and i have not seen an episode of all of this oh um, yeah I, I think you would dig the show those guys may or may not be at the party of course uh but there's they're executive producers on the show yeah. and it's following different vampires they live on staten island <laughs> I'm sold on it. Yeah, need to do it, need to do it. My old gentleman, this has been reels. I put a Z on the end of it because I grew up listening to new metal, and that's what we did. Backwards <laughs> arms, K's instead of C's, and Z's at the end of things. Um, how our society survived, I don't know. <laughs> <She'd be waiting laughs> then. But we're here. Yep, the Jenko jeans didn't kill us, it only made us stronger. Because you had to drag them around when they were wet, which meant your cardio was better, and COVID ain't fucking with that cardio. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they replaced the ankle weights of the late 80s. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> With horrible jeans. Um, so there we go. Uh, I need to I need to jump away, but I will uh, I will say it's always a pleasure chatting to you, gentlemen, and I look forward to speaking to you next month. Definitely happening, Dem. We're putting all on your shoulders to make it work. All right, I'll I'll get on your asses soon to get that get that uh, squared. Yes, squared. Um. Well, what do they say near the end of Bubble Boy? To friendship. <laughs>